Greetings, Bat Family, and welcome to Holy Batcast, brought to you by Real Fans for Real Movies. You can find us all over the internet. Just search for Holy Batcast at all the regular places. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, X, YouTube, all those places. Search for Holy Batcast and you will find us. If you're a fan of the show and you want to support us, you can also do that on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash holybatcast. You don't have to do it. No pressure. This is a low pressure thing here at Holy Batcast. We're all friends here. But if you do want to do it, it's an option for you. And in that spirit, I got to give a shout out to our newest patron, Mr. Keith Childers. Hey, Keith, thank you so much. We really do appreciate it. You're awesome. Thank you for supporting the show um, prior to now and then making it more official. That really does mean a lot to us. So, Keith, you're awesome. We love you. Thank you so much. And uh, this one goes out to you. So big thank you to Keith and a big thank you to all our patrons. You guys are really awesome and truly it just makes the show that much easier to do with that support. You know, just it's, it's nicer. So thank you guys. I really do appreciate it. We're part of the Real Fans Podcast Network. You can check out all those shows at rf4rm.com. And finally, I'm your bat host, Andy DiGenova. You can find me on Twitter, X, Instagram, uh, Letterboxd, Threads, all those places. It's just Andy DiGenova. Just my name. Nice and boring. Nice and simple. Uh, we still are not doing the 10th anniversary special. I know you're like, wait, wait, you guys, you keep promising it. It's supposed to be coming next week. But last week was a big week, and there's stuff I just got to talk about, and I got to talk about it now because we have a new Superman movie that is now in production, and it's exciting. And joining me to talk about that is a good friend. He is a... Uh, a somewhat frequent collaborator. He uh, does some other podcasting, but that's not important because tonight he's on Holy Batcast. It's Joe Fornerado. Hey, Joe. Hey, Andy. What's going on? Thank you for having me. Thanks for jumping in. I appreciate it. I I can't recall the name of the other show that you do, um, so I'm sorry. I just I can't mention it by name. I forgot. It's it's, it's like what is it? The Flaming Bat? Something like that. It's not important. I think it's trademarked that we're not allowed to actually say. Right, it. right, 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 right. Oh, the Flaming Bat is that bar I used to go to in L.A. Actually, I, th- I think I need to start another show just called the the Flaming Bat. Anyway, um, the, the the fire rises. Anyway, welcome, Joe. Does Eric know you're doing this? Does he know you're here? Um, he was okay with it. He wasn't thrilled. But he, you know, it's, it's a little, it's a little rough. We don't, we don't record again for another few days. So I think I'll be okay by the time we record. That's fine. It gives him a few days to cool down, yeah. you know, to, to refriend you on Facebook. Um, and then it, it just will smooth things over. It'll be it's fine. complicated right now. We're in the, I, it's complicated. Yeah. I get it. I get it. He's controlling same way I am on this show. I know it. We can smell our own. So I'm sure it'll be fine. I'll send a little note to apologize for sniping you, but thanks for doing it anyway. No, I, I, it's it's all good. I appreciate it. Um, I always love filling in here. Well, it's great. Um, we're going to talk about Superman. But before we talk about Superman, we got to talk about Manscaped. Supermanscaped. Yeah. Anyway, St. Patty's Day is coming, so top of the morning to you. This episode is brought to you by the St. Patrick's Day Shamrock Shavers, Manscaped. This year, don't chase rainbows, make your own pot of gold, and groom your little leprechaun with the leaders in below-the-kilt care. Say goodbye to your clover forest with a Manscaped Lawnmower 5.0 and let your confidence shine bright. Embrace the luck of the Irish and join 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped. Head over to Manscaped.com and use the code BATSCAPED for 20% off and free shipping. That's BATSCAPED. Save a little money, 20% off, free shipping, and you're getting great stuff. So you haven't uh, taken the leap for Manscaped yet. I'll tell you, I've said, I've, you know, I say it all the time, but they're the it's the best male grooming products that you can truly find. The trimmer is the best one on the market. They have lots of great stuff to help you up your grooming game, and there is no time like the present. So first of all, big thank you to everybody who's gone to Manscaped, made a purchase, used the promo code. That is awesome. And if you haven't, just go over to manscaped.com, do a little shopping. If something jumps out at you, something you want to try out, spring for it. Treat yourself. You're worth it. Just use that promo code BATSCAPED. Save the money. Get the discount, 20% off, and free shipping. And that way, you're supporting us in the process, and we love that. So um, Manscaped has everything that you need, trimmers and deodorant and... Uh, uh, face shaver and shampoo and body wash and just 
uh, nail clippers, everything, everything that you need, and it's all great stuff. So again, go to manscaped.com, use that promo code Batscaped, and we would really appreciate it. So thank you for that. Um, but now, Joe, you ready to talk about something super? I am ready. Let's talk to Superman on the Let's, Batman podcast. You know, I know it's it's holy Batcast. <laughs> I know everyone gets so mad at you for it. I, I I know you said before that some people do complain about it, but I love being able to talk Superman, so I'm I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I don't think anyone's truly complained, but I just have that little bit of guilt in me where I'm like, mm-hmm. I know it's a Batman podcast, I know, but we do cover the entire DC universe, and um, you know, Superman, he's he's not Batman, but I mean. It, not bad to be number two. I'm, so. I'm I'm a big fan, so I'm I'm definitely. It's an excuse for me to get to talk about him more because uh, we don't delve into the news too much. So this is this is fun for me. I know, and again, like I think it is fair to cover the DC universe on Holy Backcast, but like I still have pretty strict guardrails. You know, I don't I don't review other franchises. I stay within the DC guide rails to me Mm -hmm. that that feels okay so um and plus this is the launching of a new dc universe on film that will eventually incorporate batman so we're just getting ahead of it and so i did what i always like to do when i want some news to drop i left town and it worked it worked because sure enough as was rumored, as me and Preston talked about on the last episode, um, they started production on Superman on February 29th on Leap Day. And I guess the first piece to mention is it's not Superman Legacy anymore. It's just Superman. But we knew that was probably going to be the case. And so I think, you know, most DC fans, those of us who follow this stuff, we kept an eye out on social media because we're like, come on, they got to they got to give us something, right? They got to commemorate the occasion. And I know that we all were hoping for like a full on reveal of David Corn sweat in the suit. I mean, that would have been wonderful. We didn't quite get that, but we got some stuff anyway, and it's still pretty exciting. So the irony, I saw David Corn sweat share it before I saw James Gunn share it. And so what they shared was, was a shot of the Superman logo from the suit covered in snow, but we did not get the rest of the suit. And David Cornsweat just shared the photo itself, but then I went and found James Gunn's post. And here is what James Gunn said. He said, I'm overjoyed to be announcing the start of principal photography on Superman today, February 29th, which just so happens to be coincidentally an unplanned Superman's birthday. When I finished the first draft of the script, I called the film Superman Legacy. By the time I locked the final draft, it was clear that the title was Superman. Making our way to you July 2025. Happy birthday, Clark. Up, up, and away. And so, I didn't realize that February 29th was Superman's birthday until after the last episode, a listener emailed me or could have tweeted me. It might have been on Instagram. I don't remember. Um, but someone was like, actually, February 29th is Superman's birthday, which I did not know. So I appreciated the heads up. So it's like, of course, it has to be that day. Now, Joe, do you think it was actually coincidental? I kind of do, actually. I I, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, because I mean, they were just planning on pro- starting production in March. Maybe they moved it up a day to coincide with the birthday. Or, could be, could be. You know, like, I don't think they revamped production completely. I think it was like, hey, we're kind of around Superman's birthday. Can we make this work? Right. I mean, or again, like I, my thought was like, they're like, oh, it's Leap Day. How often do you get to start production on Leap Day? And that would be fun. And then yeah. it turns out that that's considered Superman's birthday, which again, I didn't know. And then even when I looked up, looked it up, it was kind of confusing. It's fuzzy. It's not. Yeah, right. I, <laughs> it's a, it's a newer thing isn't it it's like from i think so yeah i think so and then also like because that's not when the first superman appearance happened and clark has a different birthday and yep it's very like you said yeah it's very fuzzy i was like i don't know when or why someone decided that february 29th was superman's birthday but hey a bigger superman fan than me would tell because but when i looked it up i it it did not help me understand it any better i found it very confusing yeah it's almost like they combined the character's birthday which is February 29th. And then they just 
made it his birthday is 19 is it 38 or 30 yeah 1938 right yes because batman's 39 yeah yeah so it's like they combined the two and now they just recognize february 29th 1938 as his birthday all right well yeah i don't know far be it for me i'll go with it that's fine um so i guess so let's talk about the title first since i've already mentioned it and given that um how you feel about dropping the legacy and just going with Superman? I did not have an issue with Superman legacy as a title. I thought it was interesting, um, but I like this much better. I really do. It's just simple. Um, it makes it confusing whenever you're differentiating from other media or even other films, like kind of like how we say Batman 89 instead of just Batman. Um, like when we say the Batman, we have to emphasize it. The Batman. <laughs> like, I know it's oh. it's not the Batman. It's the Batman. Yeah. Like now we say Superman 78 um, when it's just Superman, the movie. I don't know what this one's going to become. <laughs> like, I'm curious, is this going to be James Gunn Superman like by default? Or is this like, going to yeah, be? I mean, on my hunches, we'll call it Superman 2025. <laughs> Because that's what that's what we tend yeah. to do, right? Like we like we say Batman the movie nineteen sixty six. You know, we say yeah. Batman eighty nine. We say Superman seventy eight. So my hunch is we'll say Superman twenty five in thirty years. Yeah, or like but, what are we, like this year are we going to just say the new Superman? Like yeah, are, like, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's funny because it is just cleaner. Like I was totally fine with Superman Legacy because there have been many other Superman movies, and so Legacy gave it a distinct identity. But mm-hmm. I also understand like just clarify it clean it up and james gunn even said in a separate post he said there hadn't been a movie called superman since 1978 and so you know like this is a brand new fresh launching point for the character just call it superman and and hard to be mad about that i i have seen seen some people twisting themselves into pretzels trying to be mad about it um (laughs) but (laughs) <laughs> I know it's shocking. I know. Um, but I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, make it simple. Keep it, keep it simple. It's totally fine. Um, so yeah, Superman. Cause even then you're right. 1978 is Superman, the movie. Yeah. And we still, we, I mean, I never refer to it as Superman, the movie. Everyone just refers to it as Superman 78. And it's odd because that we're actually going against the title when we do that. So I don't know. It, it's, it is what it is, and I I like the clean title of Superman. It's just the uh, the semantics of it at this point, right? Exactly, and and it's totally fine. Again, I get why why he did it, and and yeah, it's been what forty five years, so it's it's totally it's totally fine with me. Um, but more importantly than that, we get a glimpse of the suit, but not the whole suit. So we get to see the emblem, and as was speculated because of the table read, it is the Kingdom Come logo, but in the classic red, blue, and gold. So, and then again, it's covered by snow. It's funny. I saw a couple of people go, Ooh, is it a Christmas movie? I'm like, my (laughs) hunch is he's at the fortress of solitude. As much as I would love a Superman Christmas movie, fortress of solitude makes a lot of sense. And then in the day since they've actually confirmed that is that some of the first stuff they're shooting is fortress of solitude, which you assumed was in the movie, but I'm still happy is in the movie because it should be in the movie. Um, But it is textured. And this is one that I've certainly seen differing opinions all over the place on it. And I want to know where you stand on it, Joe. I love it. Um, I'll be honest on like, I guess on paper, if you were going to ask me, would you want the kingdom come S as the S I'd probably say no. Um, But I like the look of the reveal. Uh, and all we're getting is the S, but I like the colors. I like the, I think the snow gives it a really nice touch for the reveal. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like the, the texture, the texture has become almost like a cliche to talk about when we talk about the DC uh, costumes, but I do like that. It has some really cool definition and texture to the logo. And you could see all the detail that goes into it. Yeah, for sure. And I think that you do need the texture these days. Um, and not just with DC costumes, any superhero costumes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you just need it because it gives it that extra little bit of contrast and realism and it makes it look less like a Halloween costume, right? It just it just gives it that little bit of extra credibility to have that texture. And I like the texture on this. I think it's great. Um, like you said, and even I even said this on the last episode, is do I prefer the classic 
logo to the kingdom come? Yes, I do. So yeah, on paper, I also would have said the same. I'd be like, yeah, I, I, I want the, the classic one. But I also think that this one is close enough to the classic one that it's not, it doesn't really move the needle for me either way. I'm like, yeah, that's great. Cause it's still unmistakably the Superman logo. It's just a little more angular. It's just a little more abstract, but it is unmistakable Superman. And then seeing it in color with the gold and the blue and the red, it's Superman. So I'm like, I'm like, yeah, great. It looks good to me. Um, Again, not necessarily what I've chosen, but it still looks good. And then there was another image making the rounds that has since been disproven, which we'll talk about in a second. But even so, even though it is a fake image, this logo was put on a Superman suit on David Cornsweet. And within the context of a greater Superman suit, again, knowing that that one is not the real one, but still it was very much a classic Superman suit putting this on a classic looking Superman suit. I'm like, yeah, that's a Superman. It works for me. So I love the look of the logo. I think it looks really cool. I can't wait to see more. Um, but for now I'm like, yeah, looks good to me. Let's go. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's, I think the blue, you don't see much of the blue, but I think it does look, it doesn't look overly bright, but it also is not muted. And again, yeah. we're only seeing a little bit of it, but I do love the contrast of the yellow. I think it's the most yellow we've seen in a logo in a while. Well, um, and, and, and that's a great point because I think one of the things I don't love about the Kingdom Come logo is not necessarily the logo itself. It's the it's the red against the black. Mm -hmm. It just feels a little too dark for, for Superman. And I like yeah. that they had an explanation for it on Crisis with Brandon Routh and everything. And I think that's cool. But to have that on a more classic color scheme with the gold, I think looks great. And I, I love the gold behind the S and you're right. You just get a glimpse of the blue, but it still looks like a Superman blue. So I think that doing the classic color scheme with this logo really makes it, I think all gel. Yeah. Agreed. And, and not to even, you know, just keep going with the, the whole S thing, but also the newer um, canon of it not being an S I yeah. think it almost mm -hmm. lend to the fact that it doesn't look just like RS. It, it's a symbol. It's a Kryptonian symbol. So I think that works well too, just to try to, and it differentiates it right off the bat from any other film version of Superman. The general audience is not going to know what this S is. It's just going to see it as the new logo for the new movie. Exactly. And also, yeah, because, because the kingdom come, it's like, I mean, it's a famous comic story for comic book nerds, but it's not that renowned. So very few people are going to look at this and go, Oh, kingdom come, you know, unless you're a comic book reader. Um, so you're right. It just kind of gives it more of its own personality. And I also saw someone, I don't, I don't I, I keep wanting to say tweeted, but I think it was on threads. Cause I think that James Gunn is pretty much only on threads now and Instagram. Um, but basically said, Oh, I like how this is. It's the kingdom come logo, but it is the classic color scheme. And then it even has the yellow outline that harkens back to i want to say it was like the fleischer cartoons yes i think you're right because i did see that it was on threads i'm almost positive you're right that it was threads and i did see that conversation which i didn't even notice this until i read that that the um the yellow borders the red which was really yeah, cool. yeah yeah and so it was like you know it is kind of taking different elements of different superman logos throughout the years and integrating them into one and he just gave like a thumbs up or, or like mm. no i think he gave like the little praying hands emoji of like you yeah. got it um and again i think that's cool that makes sense you know for a new super Superman, a new cinematic Superman that he wants to be kind of the best of, of all, you know, all aspects of the character. It would make sense that he would take elements from different costumes over the years and, and integrate them into one. Yeah. And we're all just waiting to see the, the big question about the trunks. <laughs> they, they, they're hiding that from us because they know that, you know, that's for some reason, that's the big hot topic for most people. I, I have never understood that, but yep, it's so crazy to me. There's so much stuff like that where I'm like, really, that's that's the hill you want to die on. OK, yeah, I'm okay. so in, I'm so indifferent to it. But part me of too. Me, just, me too. Yep. I would love to see a way for them to add some red to that area, for lack of a better term, without doing the trunks just to mm -hmm. kind of switch it up. But um, I'm very curious how the suit looks in general. I don't care if it's trunks or not. Yeah, exactly. So me, me either. Um, anyway, speaking of that image that was making the rounds, you know, and somebody responded to me with it and I was like, listen, I, it's probably fake because right now these days I kind of, I, you know, 
like our judicial system is like innocent until proven guilty, right? Yeah. Um, I feel like any image I see in the internet is fake until proven real. That's just how I am these days. And so when I saw it, I was like, I'm pretty sure that's fake. But what I will say is, if it wasn't fake, I would have been very happy with the suit. So <laughs> I actually really liked the look of this fake suit that was making the rounds. And it got quite a bit of traction because this is the world we're living in. Mm -hmm. um, and James Gunn eventually did address it. <laughs> and um, it was a pretty biting remark just about like pointing out everything that was wrong um, in the photo. And like, of course, it's not real because, you know, one of the dudes like it looks like his his torso is you know, growing out of his body the wrong way. And the other guy looks like he's <laughs> taking a picture out of the top of his head and this, that, and the other thing. And, and so, um, James Gunn, you know, as, as usual, has no, uh, has no patience for some of this nonsense, but he, so he did, uh, he did debunk it, but at the same time I was like, well, I was kind of hoping it was real. Cause I really liked the look of it. <laughs> um, aside from the Cape being a little short, but, um, anyway, point is, we still haven't gotten the full reveal. The photo making the rounds is not real, but if it was real, I would have been okay with it. <laughs> yeah. I just hope we get the full reveal <laughs> prior to like them shooting outside. I would assume to, they're on yeah, a set yeah, right yeah. now. Yeah. Prior to the, uh, the spy pick start hitting. Yeah. And that, it's yeah. funny because like you're talking about this fake photo. I don't understand why people have to push it off as real. Just say it's a fake photo. It's an awesome fake photo. Like take credit right, for it. Right, right. Again, I liked it. I was like, I was like, I was like, it's probably fake, but I kind of wish it wasn't because I like it. But, mm -hmm. um, but again, I just yeah, I have no trust left because of especially over the past couple of years, it's got even worse. But yeah, I just don't trust anything like that. And and James Gunn, sure enough, said said as much. But yeah, it's just the way it is. I mean, you know, people want their. <laughs> their their clicks their traffic or whatever um along those lines <laughs> speaking of people wanting traffic um grace randolph like tried to have this scoop about the plot and james gunn just responded with nope <laughs> that's not it um so you know i i like that he's still got a little time to debunk these this bad info and bad rumors um and along that line is someone also reported that superman legacy's budget is over 300 million dollars and he just said, absolutely not. How in the world, do, how in the world do they think they know what our budget is? <laughs> it just thinks because even when they're debunked, they already got. Their They've track. already made the rounds. Yeah, I yeah. know. Yep. I know. It's frustrating. And, you know, so, James Gunn has to even think twice about debunking it because it's bringing more attention to it by debunking it almost. Yeah, it's it's a double edged sword, but I yep. guess better to debunk than. Yes, I'd much rather him debunk it and than us, you know, deal with the nonsense of the is it true, is it not true. I I appreciate him going after these people. I love that he he's also going to go out of his way to debunk anything Grace Randolph does. I know, I know. Uh, anyway, um, and then but one thing he did share, it originally I think was from Variety. I think reported it originally was that. Um, we also have our Perry White mm -hmm. and our Perry White uh, is being played by Wendell Pierce, who I guess was in. What is it? Jack Ryan, Jack Ryan. I know him from Jack Ryan. He was also in. Oh, uh, no, I can't remember what the other show was, because whatever the other show was, I didn't watch it, but it was a pretty big show. OK, um, but anyway, I, I'm not really familiar with him, um, but James Gunn actually shared the article, which means it's real for once. Um, and but I mean, from what little I know and looking at him, I'm like, great, works for me. Seems good. People who know him from Jack Ryan seem to think he's a great choice. So great. Let's do it. Works for me. Yep, I agree. I, I love Jack Ryan and he's great in Jack Ryan. So the minute I saw this, I'm like, yep, I'm, I'm in. I, I could see his sarcasm working really well for for Perry White. Sweet. So it is crazy. I mean, they started production, but they are still rounding out the cast. Now, I would so. assume that's just the announcing, right? Like, you got to assume, like, and you know more about this stuff than I do, but, like, these people have to have already been in place. They're I mean, just not announcing it yet, right? For the most part. I mean, they're, okay. it's not unprecedented that, like, there could be some last minute additions to the cast for whatever reason. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not sure why the Perry White thing came out. I think it came out, like, the day after. They started production. Yeah, it was March first. I'm looking at yeah. the article right now. It was Boris Kitt who ran. That's the one that um, James. Gunn Is that shared. Hollywood Reporter or Variety? 
You know what's weird? I don't remember where Boris Kidd is. I thought it was Hollywood Reporter was Boris Kidd, but James Gunn actually just cropped the photo, and I'm just seeing Boris Kidd's name, so I don't see where okay. it is. Yeah, I, yeah, maybe it's Hollywood Reporter. So apologies. Um, but anyway, yeah. So yeah, who knows? Like, yeah, there there certainly could be cast members that they've not announced. Um, you know, perhaps another villain. I don't know. Um, or yeah, they 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 could still have some things they need to finalize, and and we'll just see how that goes. But, um. It's exciting times. A new Superman movie is coming our way. New title, production's begun, and it is only a matter of time before we do get to see Superman in all his glory. Yeah, I, I can't wait. Um, obviously, uh, we're boycotting it as Zack Snyder fans. So I... I... Oh, well, tell me how it was. Right. Or why well, you can't. I mean, I guess someone else is. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah. No, I'm... It's these are the these are the fun times leading up to it and i can't wait to get all these reveals i mean we, we just got the suit reveal and we just talked about it for about 25 minutes and we didn't even get the full reveal it was just the s it's <laughs> so, just just the s but so what's we're gonna have you know you're gonna be able to talk another 20 minutes about the boots and the trunks and all that that's what we'll do just one one piece of the costume every episode <laughs> for the next six months Today, we're going to talk about the sleeves. So we got a lot of thoughts on the sleeves. It would um, actually be really funny if that's how James Gunn uh, does it, where like every every week it's a different section of the suit instead of just doing a full reveal. I, that would be kind of fun. It reminded me like the the Godzilla 1998 marketing. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that? When it was like his foot what I've as heard long about as this, yeah. this truck or, you know, <laughs> his eyes as big as this thing. And yeah. <laughs> um. So, yeah, it's exciting. I'm psyched. I can't wait for it. I'm glad it's happening. And, and, you know, I'm got all my fingers and toes crossed. And like I said, this is the fun part where we'll just start getting more news and info. And, you know, that day I was out of town. I was with Catherine. We were going to a wedding and we were like having like lunch with Catherine's parents and some other friends of ours who were also going to be going to the wedding. And I was a terrible friend because I was on my phone just like, (laughs) looking at like oh no 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 like they, they started production on superman and they got this and i was looking at what people were saying and i was messaging you guys and i was like oh i was, I was a very bad friend but that's what happens when a new dc movie goes into production can't help myself no i i still remember where i was when they revealed the uh the last two batmobiles i still remember where i was when i first got the first pick of ben affleck and the first pick of uh of pattinson's batmobile i still remember exactly where i was um, so do work. I. It's, yeah. it's so weird, but that's just how it is. And I, I remember you sharing the the BS picture that you shared with us the other day, first, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then the, you shared the legit picture also. <laughs> I, what are you talking about? I don't even remember what it was now, but I knew it was. What <laughs> <laughs> well, because like that morning we were like, we we're like, oh, you think we'll get something today? And I was like, what are you talking about? It's already out there, guys. You haven't seen it. And yeah, I found this really terrible. Halloween costume picture <laughs> with like the face mask and everything. Yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, it's, it's exciting time. Superman, not Superman legacy, but again, that's okay with me. It works. Um, and more as it develops. Oh, oh, that was what I was going to say. There's one more thing is Nicholas Holt was just on Michael Rosenbaum's podcast. Yes. Inside of you, I think is the, the yes. Yeah. Uh, which I have listened to um, on occasion, but he's, he said he's been working out for the role of Lex Luthor because he said there's like a line of dialogue in there that's similar to all-star Superman when Lex says something about his muscles are real. Mm -hmm. And so Nicholas Holt felt inspired by that to actually, you know, get in better shape to stand toe to toe with Superman. So I thought that was kind of fun. Oh, very nice. Yeah. I I just started it. Um, I'll probably finish the podcast tomorrow, but I did start listening to it. Yeah, I, I have not. I just saw that as like, a you know, because now what ha- what's going to happen is, you know, they're going to pull one sound bite and run it, you know, run 20 different stories based on yep. different sound bites. But that was the only one I saw this evening before we started recording. So, all right, Superman coming our way. More uh, more info and more news as it develops. So this is kind of a, a little episode, but I thought that the event was worth commemorating. It was a big enough occasion. Um, But if you're down, Joe, maybe you could help me clean out a few emails. Yeah, absolutely. That would be really helpful. I'd really like that. So um, let's check in with you, fine feathered finks. And there's sure to be Batman talk here because it's time to open the Wayne Manor mailbox. 
this morning again for Land Runner Mailbox. You've got mail. Derek. All right. First email, Joe, I don't know if you've ever been lucky enough to be on an episode where we get an email from the objective geek. Oh, I, I don't think I have now that you said, or if I was, it was an easy one. It wasn't one of the, the difficult ones that makes everyone's head spin. <laughs> um, anyway, um, it's Chris, the objective geek. He's great. We love him. Um, but yeah, he's just, um, you never know what you're going to get when you get an email from him, but here's what he says. He says, Hey guys, I hope all is well. I hope Jamie's on the episode so I can say go chiefs for winning the Super Bowl." Um, he's not here, but he'll hear you. Uh, anyway, here's my question. Sorry, it could be an episode topic, but how would you rank the cinematic Alfreds? In my opinion, any order would be a good answer because they're all great. But personally, I would rank Michael Caine, then Michael Goff, then <clears throat> Zimbalist from Mask of the Phantasm, then Andy, Ser Andy Serkis, then Jeremy Irons, then Ray Fiennes, and then Alan Napier. Keep up the great work. Um, all right, Chris. So... Rankin the Alfreds. What do you think, Joe? Um, I would go Michael Caine, Michael Goff. Um, and sadly, I can't even remember the actor that does Mask of the Phantasm. He did mention it. Um, I would go with him next. And then, yeah, I think I'm pretty much in line with him. Uh, then, you know, oh, God, I'm drawing a blank of uh, the Batman. Um, Andy Circus. Andy Circus, yes. And then um, yeah, and then I would go. Unfortunately, Al Napier being last kind of stinks because that's not fair because he is really good. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, I wouldn't put him last, but I I think I, I might put him ahead of um Andy Circus just because we didn't get a lot of Andy Circus. I, I would I would I would put Jeremy Irons and Alan Napier oh, above Circus. I totally skip Jeremy Irons. I would put Jeremy Irons over Alan Napier and then um Alan Napier and then uh Andy Circus. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with the top three. Michael Caine, Michael Goff, then is it Ephraim Zim Zimbalist from Mask of the Phantasm? Is that right? I've never been good with the names of the albums. No, all right. Well, anyway, I, I, I feel like that feels right for the top three. But then I think I would do Jeremy Irons, then Alan Napier, then Circus, then Ray Fiennes. Just because I feel like Ray Fiennes in Lego Batman didn't... Like, oh, yeah, I didn't, didn't even have a ton. Ray Fiennes. Yeah. Didn't have a ton, but... Yeah, I think, I mean, I can, I can confidently say Michael Caine is the best of the best because you're right. We've never had a bad Alfred. Agree. It's, and if it's you ever, very, it's tough without like writing this down and actually thinking about it. <laughs> well, um, basically is we pretty much agree with Chris more or less. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Next episode is from Eddie. It says, Hey guys, I've been loving the variety of episodes recently. The mental health episode was incredible. I've needed Batman at various points in my life to help me remind me of the joy to be found in the world through art. It's not discussed enough and episodes like this can help others show vulnerability and normalize mental health issues. So bravo, Andy. Speaking of a variety of episodes, do you think you'll do an episode based on Batman, the animated series toys or even board games? For instance, I can't tell you how much I appreciated the fact that no one on the podcast had a clue how to play Almost Got Him. I spent two hours trying to figure it out when it was released, and it stayed in the box ever since. <laughs> it might be a fun discussion. Final random question. Um, oh, in conjunction with Disorder. If you could insert Batman into any Disney film, what would it be? My choice would be The Rescuers. Just change New York to Gotham and have Bernard and Bianca hit up Batman for some mice-sized batterings to fight off the crocodiles in the swamp. All the best, Eddie. All right, thanks, Eddie. And thank you for um, the kind words about the show. I'm glad you enjoyed the mental health episode. I, I've really appreciated all the feedback I've gotten on that, and I've, um, I'm glad it, it was helpful to you, too. So, um... Animated series toys, I mean, probably. We've now done Batman and Robin and Batman Forever, so why not? Um, board games, that could be fun, because there are quite a few out there, but I'm glad to hear we're not the only ones who didn't know, how to, <laughs> who couldn't figure out, almost got them. It's so weird. Um, and then final question, a Batman in a Disney movie. Hmm, Joe, what do you think? The first one that came to my mind was Peter Pan. Like, it'd be really cool to put Batman in that scenario. 
Um, but I don't have a logistic reason as to where he would fit or why, but find a way to have Batman <laughs> have a, have a way to have Batman fight Captain Hook in uh, Peter Pan on a pirate ship. I think that'd be fun. Um, other than that, I couldn't really think of anything off the top of my head. I mean, there is pirate Batman, right? Mm-hmm. Like you could, you could go that route, like kind of the Elseworlds pirate Batman and have him. I think there's a crazy like Grant land. Morrison thing there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. I don't, I don't know. I like the rescuer's answer. Um, I should have I should have an easier answer for this, but nothing nothing springs to mind. I ironically, what I'm thinking of is Oliver and Company, because again, it's sort of it's New York City, so I could see New York City being close enough to Gotham. You could kind of do Oliver and Company with, you know, almost gives me some super pets vibes with Batman. I I don't know. It's a weird answer, but it's the one I'm thinking of. I don't mm-hmm. know. Um, Otherwise, I have to think about it. It could, I mean, maybe Frozen and Olaf could be like Mr. Freeze and it'd be like Batman versus <laughs> Olaf. Not Elsa. Olaf. <laughs> Although Elsa would make a lot more sense. Um, anyway, so yeah, I, <laughs> I'll, I'll think about it. But that's all I got right now, Eddie. Thank you. You'll think of something tomorrow. And be of, like, course oh, I, of course I will. Answer. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I'm skipping all, uh, um, skipping over all the 10th anniversary messages because again, I'm saving those. Um, next one here is from Ron Messbarger. It says, Hey guys, I love your toy casts. Uh, and I thought you could maybe cover the Funko pops, Andy and Brendan with both of you having little ones. Have you started getting in the fantastic world of DC imagine next, uh, both the play sets and the figures. My son has outgrown them, but they're so cool. I'm putting them away for the grandchildren. I hope very far down the road. Um, Ron, thank you. So I'm glad you enjoy the toy episodes. Brendan and I love doing them. Um, they're not, I'll be honest, they're not the most popular episodes. That's fine. I don't care, but they're so fun. <laughs> we have such a good time. Um, so yeah, Funko Pops, I can, I can add that to the list. Joe, I think that you also have a Funko prop, a Funko Pop problem. Yes, I really do. I'm looking at way too much right now as we're recording and, it's one of those things where you start and then you're like, why did I keep going? Cause there's just so many. What's crazy and is I, I fought the urge for a long time. I did too. And I had very few, very few. And the ones I had were gifts. I didn't even buy them. And then you're right. Then like some start coming out and I'm like, well, well I need the one that's Batman in the bat wing. Like I need that. <laughs> oh, oh my God. I need the Michael Keaton Batman. Oh my God. They're doing one. F- they're doing ones for Batman, Batman returns, Batman forever and Batman and Robin. Well, I need all those. And then forget about it. Yeah. You, you get like FOMO where you're like, I can't, I can't not have this one cause it might sell out and right. you don't even want it. You're just worried that you might <laughs> miss out on it. And it it does become this. Cra- it's like the Beanie Baby craze, like for for oh, nerds. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. The ones that you buy because you think they're going to sell out don't sell out. That's why they make so many of those. Like you, you're not going to get ahead of the game that way. <laughs> and, yep. and you you just yeah, it becomes this complete addiction for no other reason to like you said. You have to have all of them. Like every movie that comes out, I'm like, well, how do I get that one and not that one? Like I can't just get the one. Yeah, that would be silly. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, yeah, yeah, uh, it would be too, it'd be fun to do fun go pops. Um, and then DC Imagine Next, I have not gotten those for Harley yet. Um, we love the little people and Harley loves mm-hmm. the little people. So she has little people, Batman, Justice League, DC, Suicide Squad. She has two bat caves. She has multiple Batmobiles, but it's all the little people ones. Imagine Next, maybe that is next, but I've seen those in the store and I love them and I've been tempted not just for her, but for me too, but she's only two. So the little people work for now, but you have two kids, Joe. Do you, do you have the Imagine X ones? So my daughter never got into the Imagine X Batman stuff. Um, we got some hand-me-downs from my uh, little cousins that had the Imagine X Batman and we have some of the old like bat caves and stuff. They're really cool, but I'm with you. We have a lot of the little people. And I don't remember if it's you. I I think it's Brendan. We have those wooden. It's like a wooden Batmobile with like these little, little wooden figures. And my son loves these. And I want to say we got them at like Pottery Barn as a gift. Like they're like like a random thing at Pottery Barn. I don't know why I think it's Pottery Barn. 
But like, yeah, it's a wooden Batmobile, like an arts and craftsy looking Batmobile. And they're little like they're the size of little people, but Cute. they're wood and they're really okay. cool. I got to see if I can find them because I know my son plays with them all the time and, and see if I can send you a picture to show you because I'm almost positive Brendan has them. OK, and yeah. very cool. But yeah, the Imaginex stuff, I didn't know that they were still as big as they were like five years ago because they were really big. Like when my my niece and nephew were that age and my little cousins. So we do have a, quite a few of them, and I'm hoping my son gets more into them. Right now, he's he's only three, and right now everything is just cars and trains. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. She does like playing with my bat wheels as mm-hmm. well, and I know that Henry loves the bat wheels too. Yes. Um, I, <laughs> um, Brendan and Henry just got their Christmas gifts from me. Um, <laughs> I had been sitting on them a little too long, but yeah, I sent, I sent Henry a bunch of bat wheels. Cause I guess he's obsessed too. And, and I have my bat wheels just here on my desk, but Harley will run into my office and grab them. So, you know, again, not imagine X, but she certainly, you know, she certainly has the interest in the love for Batman, which is great. <laughs> Every time we go to shop, right. My son picks out a little hot wheels car. And mm. he does go for the Batman one sometimes. So we have a, we have like a gold Batmobile with like one fin on the top. I don't even know what this design is from. But Hot Wheels makes a lot of random little Batmobiles. They do. And I have a bunch of them too. Because I'm like, they are so weird, but they're like $2. So I'm like, well, I'm still going to get it. You know? <laughs> There's a purple animated series one, yeah. I feel like. Yeah, I, have that I got one. all sorts of I have one. That one. Yeah. Um, our dear friend Jay Yaws sent me a, it's the 89 Batmobile, but it's white and black, like a zebra. Oh, okay. I, I envision it as a snow Batmobile, but yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, you're right. They have some really random ones now and we just turned this into a toy cast. Look at us. That, that went really quickly into that. Yeah. But Too they're exciting. fun. Um, all right. Next message here is from Austin. It says, Hey guys, I finished, <laughs> I finished your state of the superhero episode. Are your, your, uh, your state of the superhero media episode? And I want to throw in my two cents after listening. I thought about the last time a superhero movie show or comic impacted me. And I reflected back on why the stories that did have an effect landed so well. And what I came up with was pretty simple. We want our heroes to fight and win battles that matter. The stories that show emotion, loss, and perseverance. I think of the ending of the first season of The Flash, or Wonder Woman's battle in No Man's Land, or Superman's optimism in Superman and Lois, or Bruce's drive in the Dark Knight trilogy. The amazing writing that we've had in movies like Zorro, Spider-Man 2, and the Spider-Verse movies. In the end, I don't think it's fatigue that we're fighting. I think it's sincerity. If we can get back to a place where our heroes are honest and true in what they're fighting for and not just a cheap cash grab, people will show up to cheer them on and we can see true box office success. I hope it wasn't too long, but it was just some thoughts I wanted to share. All the best, Austin. Um, Thanks, Austin, and appreciate your thoughts. So, Joe, um, what do you think about what Austin says? Is that is the missing ingredient sincerity? Yeah, and, and I'll even tie in sincerity with just emotion. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I have said numerous times, I will forgive a ton of stuff if you can strike an emotional chord with me. And it's funny, the first thing that came to my mind, because when we talk about superhero fatigue, I think like a lot of people have even been lumping Marvel into this for a change, which never used to happen. But it's funny, and I've only seen this movie once, but everyone hated on the Eternals. Mm Mm-hmm. I saw it once. I'll be honest. I wasn't really into seeing it again, but there was an emotional beat in that movie that got me. And when I got to that part, I almost forgave everything about that movie because it felt sincere. I will agree with him. Like when, when you get to a part like that in any movie and it gets me, I'm, I'm going to be in because it's not easy to, to hit that emotional beat on movies that are, you know, that lack that sincerity. I think that's a really strong point that he's making because I never really thought of it that way that they do go hand in hand. And when you have that story to tell that way, I think it it just makes you buy into everything else just that much further. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and I, I agree. I mean, and, and I think that you and I do see eye to eye on that. And I think we've even talked about that is, is that for us, that X factor of what makes us truly fall in love with a superhero movie is heart and emotion. And, you know, we talked about that, I think with, um, with Aquaman too is, mm-hmm. um, and first viewing, we felt it was a little short changed on that. I feel like on second viewing, I, I, there was more there than I initially gave it credit for. Um, 
but that's just, I think, very important to us. But I feel like, you know, I mean, even last year, Blue Beetle and The Flash, I think both yes. had a lot of sincerity and a lot of emotion. So it's not that those movies were lacking that, um, but people didn't go to find out, you know, which I guess is, the, is, is part of the problem. So I do agree that that is what makes any movie, but especially superhero movies, truly resonate is the emotion, the emotional core of the film. Um, but I don't think that explains people going or not going because that's something that's kind of hard to sell and market. Mm -hmm. um, and then even there are movies that have it that get overlooked and there are movies that don't have it that still make money. So I think that your argument is more for the quality of a movie than it is about what drives people to see them, you know? Yeah, like the word of mouth or the the legs that a movie will have. It's I think right now we're in a point where everyone is trying to figure out the answer and nobody is able to figure out the answer right now of what is getting people into the theater. And Yeah, yeah. I agree with them that the emotion has a has a real big factor in the quality and what maybe people want, but you're right, how do you market that? And it used to be you were marketed a good time. And it's almost like as far as the quality of the film is going, the paradigm is shifting from people just want to have fun to, okay, now we want something different. We want more than that. And, but you're right. How do you market more than that? <laughs> and it's hard. Like, I don't think they, un they know how to market a good time with emotion. It's like, they're trying to balance that. And cause like the flash wasn't marketed as an emotional movie from what I remember. I mean, there was a, there was a little bit of it, but that's not that's not what it's you hard. sell in marketing, right? That's yeah. like, you know, you, you're says, selling the sizzle, not the steak. And then when people go to see the film, then they understand, you know, that there there's heart there or there's not. Um, but again, I don't I don't feel like the flash was lacking that. No, so, absolutely. Um I, yeah, so I mean, me and you both probably cried more in the flash than we did any other movie last year. Like that's, um, that's yeah, one hundred percent. That movie still gets me. So Anyway, Austin, it's a great point. And I, I do think that, you know, both Joe and I agree with you in that for us, that is what elevates, you know, a superhero story, a superhero movie are the ones that, you know, strike an emotional chord. Again, that's why I think Wonder Woman is a, such a great superhero movie or Superman the movie or, you know, or, yeah. um, you know, or The Flash or, or, you know, or, you know, the Captain America, the first Avenger, which is another one of my favorites. Cause like, for me, that is a really wonderful emotional movie. So mm -hmm. anyway, I think it's, it's certainly an interesting point. And every, every movie you mentioned has different types of emotion too. It's not sure, just sure. one type, you know, we're getting emotions from different aspects. I mean, one of my favorite emotional moments is from uh, the first Aquaman, which most people don't consider the first Aquaman, a very emotional movie, but for some reason, the end of that movie really gets me with me too. Arthur and me with too. Arthur and, um, uh, what, oh, what's his mom's name? Atlanta. Um, Atlanta, re, you know, reuniting on that dock or on the, yeah. um, you know, that's, that is one of my favorite moments in the DCU. Yeah, I agree with you. And again, I mean, even the ending of Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom is, mm, <laughs> it, it did get me until the very last moment where he goes, I'm Aquaman. Yeah. Um, but up until then, like, I'm like, it, it still, you know, was able to capture me emotionally, but yeah, you know, that's, it's an important element that I think all the best superhero movies do have. Um, next message is from Mike Ortego. It says, Hey guys, um, you may have already talked about this, but I was wondering, do you remember what your first Batman comic was? And if so, do you still have it? Mine was Batman number 440, the first place of a lonely place of dying. I remember it very fondly because I was nine years old and I had just seen Batman 89 and my mom bought it for me at a convenience store. I don't have the original copy, but I did buy a copy on eBay years later. Anyway, thanks for all that you do. Love your podcast. God bless Mike in Louisiana. Thanks, Mike. Always good to hear from you. So, Joe, do you remember your first Batman comic? So it's a little bit of a. I don't want to say a cop-out answer, but I did not collect a lot of floppies when I was a kid, but I Who remember... Who are you, Brendan? <laughs> I, I loved the adaptations of the movies. So I got to say Batman 89 had to have been my favorite or my first um, actual comic. But if I went floppy, believe it or not, the one I remember is a Robin annual where he fought Eclipso. It was like an Eclipso story. And 
it was like a crossover event with Eclipso. It was a Robin annual number one. I know nothing about the story whatsoever, but I remember having this and I remember having the cover. And at the time I probably thought it was Dick Grayson, not Tim Drake. I knew nothing about what I was reading, but I just saw Robin and I picked it up and I still have that comic. And that's one that I really remember having. But other than that, I mean, I, I had all the film adaptations. That was what I've read more than anything. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I can't guarantee it was my first first because there were a few that I think I, I got at the same time, which was the summer of 1989. <laughs> Shocking. Um, but the one that I consider my first was the Batman annual from 1989. Um, and it's this amazing cover art of Batman in the snow. It's beautiful. So it was Batman annual um, number 13, 1989. It says it was published in April of 89, but the cover is June, 1989. So I think that, you know, this was obviously when I really got into Batman, Batmania was hot and heavy summer of 1989. And I got this at the white hen pantry, which was like seven 11 in Lockport, Illinois. So Lockport, my hometown, and we didn't have seven 11. We had white hen. Um, which <laughs> does neither here nor there was also uh, the sponsor of my little league team. So I also played for white hen pantry. Um, but yeah, so I, I bought it at white hen must've been with my allowance money or whatever. I didn't really get allowance. So somehow I had money. Maybe it was with my birthday money or something, but yeah. And I do believe I still have it. It's probably not in great shape, but I do think I have it. So and Batman annual number 13 is the one that strikes me as the first that's a really cool cover that i've actually never seen before did you did you google it yeah it's and great isn't it what's crazy is there's like not a lot of recognizable people that are in it but it does say christopher priest is a writer but he's not on the cover hmm very odd like I don't know what to take. I'm just looking at DC database because I, I wasn't familiar with Yeah, it. that's yeah, yeah, that's the best place. But um, very cool cover. I isn't really that cover like that. amazing? Yeah. And what's funny is I don't remember the story inside. I don't. I just remember that cover and I remember carrying it around that summer. And I'm not even familiar with George Pratt as a cover artist. I apologize if there is like a huge George Pratt fan out there that is like crucifying me right now for not knowing him, but I'm not familiar with that name. Yeah, I'm not either, honestly. But yeah, there you have it. Look it up, guys. Google image it. It's great. Um, all right. Next email here is from Zach. It says, hey, guys, I was listening. I was listening to your rankings about Bruce Wayne's love interests. And you mentioned that Rachel had never made it into the comics. I could be wrong, but in Batman year two, there was a Rachel that Bruce was seeing mm -hmm. who turned out to be the Reaper's daughter. I'm assuming that's who Rachel Dawes is based off of. Thoughts? Um, thanks, Zach. I didn't remember that. I, I did read year two, but it's been years now. Um, so I didn't remember a Rachel. But um, what do you think, Joe? Do you think there's a connection between her and Rachel Dawes? Um, I never took it as that. I did just recently read Batman year two because um, Ryan Lauer covered it on his show. And I like to try to read along with that when I can. And I haven't read Batman year two in forever. So I was like, oh, let me go check that out. Mm -hmm. And there is a Rachel, it's Rachel Caspian introduced in that book, but I, I don't, I mean, I don't want to, you know, um, sound like I'm killing his theory. I just never got that idea. Um, it's possible. I mean, he might've just taken the name and kind of as a homage, just, just strictly as the name. Um, not a lot of similarities character wise though. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm getting is, is aside from the name and based on what you just told me and what, what was in the email, um, it seems like the name is really all they have in common. So mm -hmm. it seems like maybe more coincidental than anything. So, but I appreciate the heads up Zach and, and yeah, I didn't remember a Rachel in that story. Cause again, it's been a minute, so I certainly appreciate it. Um, next email here is from Matthew Herridge. It says, Hey guys, Gotham by Gaslight gave me an idea. What if the DCU told a story with all three Robins becoming wards of Bruce Wayne at around the same time and beginning with their Nightwing Redwood or Redwood <laughs> with their Nightwing Red Hood and possibly Red Robin alter egos? There's a way to explain something like Joker being responsible for Jason's tragedy for him to take on the Red Hood persona as a way of embracing his fear of the Joker. Just some quick thoughts, but what do you think is a way to introduce the Bat family in a way where Batman is still relatively young? 
Anyway, congrats on 10 years. This show is truly something special and immediately gets to the top of my listens no matter what I'm doing, unless I'm behind on my movies, which happens a lot. Sorry. Um, thank you, Matthew, and thank you for the kind words for 10 years of Holy Backcast. I appreciate that. And always nice to hear it goes to the top of the listen list. That's great. Um, so I... I what you're saying is in the it sounds like for the DCU, like the cinematic universe, they could all become the bat family at the same time, instead of like it's Dick Grayson and he leaves and becomes Nightwing and then it's Jason Todd and he dies or doesn't die and becomes Red Hood doing it all at once. I think that's ambitious, but I think it's creative and I certainly think there's a way to make it work. So it's an interesting shortcut that I would not be opposed to. What do you think, Joe? I, it wouldn't be my preferred way, but I understand like it might be a cool dynamic to remove the, you know, partnership and make it a team aspect right from the get-go or literally a family right from the get-go was pretty interesting. Um, and imagine having something tragic happen to Jason Todd while Tim and Dick are already there. That would be pretty interesting. It's definitely a different idea, and I do kind of like it now the more I think about it. It's just not something I would have ever thought of, to be honest with you. I, I, know, I, I know, same. Yeah, I'm for sure. Of, at first when he said, I'm like, no, I can't do that. Like, that's not that's not something I would be on board with. But the more I really did think about it, it, it sounds pretty intriguing. Yeah, I mean, it is it is creative. It would be a challenge. But again, I don't hate it be interesting yeah as if they were all adopted at the same time and and kind of became the bat family at once it'd be interesting um all right next message here is from steven uh this says hey guys i hope you're doing well here is a prediction question for you what do you think could happen Oh, what do you think could happen after Matt Reeves releases the Batman part two James Gunn's universe will be in motion. Do you think it's a wait and see approach from the studio on the audience's reaction on whether or not they'll allow Reeves to continue his story given that it given it doesn't end after two movies or will they pull the plug on the Reeves universe regardless to avoid confusion with multiple Batman on screen. Also learning from past mistakes, old management and allow Gunn to carry out his vision regardless of box office and fan reaction. Sorry if it's a loaded question, but I just wanted to know your thoughts. Now for <laughs> you're going to love this, the obligatory <laughs> fan casting part of the email. Um, Edward Norton as Jonathan Crane Scarecrow and Dave Bautista as Bane. He's a friend of James Gunn and is now the perfect opportunity to cast him in The Brave and the Bold. Also, how about Lawrence Fishburne as Ra's al Ghul? Bat hangers forever. <laughs> Cheers, Stephen. <laughs> oh, thanks, Stephen. Oh, my God. I haven't heard bat hangers in a minute. Ah, oh, wow. It's been a while. Oh, see, now I get Oh my God, bad hangers. Yes, yes. Awesome. All right. Well, Stephen, thank you for the message. Um, so, question. What do you think happens to the Matt Reeves universe after the Batman part two, Joe? Well, poor Jamie. He's still getting those Lawrence Fishburne jokes. Uh, how many years later? He's going to get them until the day he dies. <laughs> unless I die first. <laughs> um I think I don't remember if I've heard you talk about this or we've discussed it before, but it's a great question as far as what is going to happen with the Batman. I. Everyone has always assumed it's going to be at least a trilogy. Um, mm, yeah. I do think it would have to be a colossal failure for them to pull the plug on it. But I'm, I don't know. I shouldn't even say colossal failure. Like what I do think it's wait and see. I don't think they're writing a check to Batman three before Batman two is out. Correct. Yeah. But I think as long as the budget is in check for Batman two, which I could imagine. I mean, the first film had a higher budget because of COVID and all that. It was supposed to be a pretty low budget. Um, Again, I don't know anything about the budget for the second one. I would hope it's going to be relatively smaller and it'll be a successful film. And I think if that's the case, they'll let him continue the story if he wants to. If Matt Reeves decides he's done, though, I don't think they're going to try to make a third one without him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of questions about what's going to happen with that story. 
but they they do have like the penguin series on hbo they're not they're not going to just abandon it if it's working right yeah. but i am curious about having you know wb in the past has been so weird with different interpretations of characters at the same time but I would hope they've discussed this, you know, since day one of James Gunn being there. But I don't know. Like, it's is WB really changing just like that? Or are they going to turn around and go back on it? I, I really don't have an answer. And I hope that everything just stays the way that they were planning on. You know, let James Gunn do his thing with the Batman Brave and the Bold over here. And let Matt Reeves do his thing as long as it's successful over there. But I think there's more they're more likely to pull the plug on Reeves at this point than they are the brave and the bold based on the success or lack thereof of the sequel. And I'm not saying it's not going to be successful. I'm just saying, I think they're waiting and seeing, and I I'm pulling for it. I want it to be successful, obviously. And I don't see a way that it's not at least somewhat successful, but I do think they're going to wait and see. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I'm trying to like toe the line there. Like, I don't want to no, make it I seem know. like I'm rooting against it because I'm not. But I, I just don't think they're they're assuming anything. I think so, too. I think they're totally waiting and seeing. You know, it is it is the train that's already in motion, you know, while James Gunn and Andy Muschietti, you know, finish building the train of the brave and the bold. It's also one of their biggest movies in the past few years. Uh, so yes, of like for now, the plan is to let Reeves build on his universe. So they let the penguin show happen and then they're doing the Batman part two. Anything in addition to that, I think is all based on how those two projects do, you know, if the penguin gets huge viewership on max, then they will be like, you know, there were murmurs of other shows, but I feel like those have all gone quiet. Mm-hmm. But I feel like if the Penguin is some huge hit on Max, you might start hearing those rumblings again. And then the Batman Part 2, if it does what the first one does or better, you better believe they're at least going to finish the trilogy. If it bombs, I think it's a perfect opportunity to pull the plug. The real question is, what if it just does okay? Yeah, what if it makes like four or five hundred million? Right. What if it does four hundred million, which is fine. Yeah. Like, then what? Like, are they committed to it as, you know, to to let Reeves finish out, assuming that his plan is for a trilogy? It's what we all assume. I don't know if he's ever said that. Not that I remember, but we all assume that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's to me the real question mark, because if it if the sequel does what the first one does, there's no reason to not just do another one. And especially because the timing will be such that we'd probably get the Brave and the Bold between the Batman part ones and two. but that's okay. You've essentially got a new start and then you're going to get the ending chapter slightly out of order, but it's not that bad of a timing to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And if what all, if what we all assume is true, there will be no confusion between these two Batman because the approaches will be wildly different. And I'm, I'm also curious, like what if, let's say for argument's sake, the Batman does okay or bombs and the penguin is one of the best shows ever on HBO. Like, like, do they just continue the Penguin show? I mean, I doubt it. <laughs> I, feel like I don't have an answer. Yeah, or, yeah. And then there was also, remember, Matt Reeves is staying on and producing the Arkham show, which is now part of the DCU. Yeah, that's where I don't know yeah. what's going to happen with that. Yeah, that's, that's where it seems like everything's yeah. kind of getting fuzzy. We're like, okay, are they keeping Reeves on because they're already trying to move, remove him from his own thing? It's it's weird that he's kind of doing both now. I, I don't know. And I'm glad that they're working with Matt Reeves. It's clear that they don't want to lose him. Yeah. Um, but I'm very curious where everything is going. And, and listen, we've been we're a year out now from where the first announcement came of what we were getting of, you know, phase one. And it was only supposed to be half of what we were supposed to get in phase one. And we still haven't heard anything else of what the other projects are. So right, right. we still have a lot to come here in just phase one of the new DCU or whatever we're calling it, the you know, the James Gunverse. So there's a lot of question marks. And yeah, he, he said, I apologize for the loaded question, but it's a fun question because listen, I'm not gonna turn down two different Batman on screen. And yeah, you know, and and again, I I am totally fine with like 
have your cake and eat it too. Right. It, with any, yeah. with anything, but especially with Batman, you know, and this way, you know, the people who, who are in love with Reese's version continue to get that for people who are hungry for a different version. They can get that they're brave in the bold and that's fine. You know, like, you know, they're, I'm okay. I'm okay with multiple versions of Batman happening at the same time. And as long as people are willing to go see both, so will WB, you know, yeah. they like money. And that's the bottom line is, is as long as it's making money, they're going to want to keep going. Um, but here's another interesting scenario though. What if, what if the Batman is a huge runaway success, the Batman sequel, but the brave and the bold bombs, they're yeah. not going to pull yeah. the plug on the James Gunn universe. So do they do they even consider stopping the Reeseverse to maybe work into the not not work uh, the character into the James Gunn universe? But do they think that that's the reason why Brave and the Bull bombed and maybe try to squash one to favor the other? There's there's a lot of questions here, and I hope none of this happens like i hope we just get both and everything's happy and we get both versions and you know it's like having you know your your black label story over here with the matt reeves stuff and the more traditional stuff over here and everything is you know just peaches and cream but it, i i don't know and we all have a right to kind of be skittish with wb when it comes to this kind of stuff i mean <clears throat> yeah yeah i mean and honestly that's the bigger question about the james gunn connected universe anyway right mm-hmm. what if superman bomb it's like sad. It's I sad sure, I, think I sure hope that's not the case. And I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful about it um, with his recent track record, but like it could happen. And, and what's then the definition what happens, of bomb? Right? That's the other part. Like what's the definition of disappointment? You know, like yeah, we're talking yeah. about a, a universe that was squashed because 890 million, whatever BVS made was considered a disappointment. So, we don't know what they're thinking at this point because things are so different now than they were back then. And right. <clears throat> they're so reactive and you hope that, you know, it's, it's enough of a different regime where they're going to just let James Gunn do his thing and not panic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Ah, well, it'll be fun to watch <laughs> or maybe it won't. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's never a dull moment as a DC fan. So this is kind of, we're just along for the ride again. As always. Um, all right, we're going to do one last email here um, because it is applicable to what we've been talking about. And uh, this is more emails than I planned on doing. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. This is helpful. I feel productive. It's like clearing out the DVR. I feel back <laughs> in the DVR days. <laughs> no, this um, was fun. Anyway, uh, Mark's is Mark Jurasevic. He says, hey, guys, I'm looking forward to hearing the score uh, to Superman Legacy by John Murphy. I was listening to the score for Superman and Lois by Dan Romer, and it's wonderful and worth a listen if you haven't done so. It's original, but evokes the character of Superman and his world perfectly. I'm sad to see the series end, especially after a powerful and emotional third season, but I'm glad it'll get to finish on its own terms. On another Superman-related note, what are your thoughts on the numerous characters appearing in Superman, especially since that we assume there are more than cameos. I'm trying to remain positive, but I'm a little concerned that the movie will be focused on world building rather than Superman or his alter ego, Clark Lois and his arch villains. The latter is what Superman deserves. Superman is a character that can easily stand on his own. And while a character such as black Adam benefited from other heroes, I'm not sure Superman legacy will regards Mark. Um, this is an interesting question. I've seen fans uh, asking it. So, Joe, uh, what do you think? Are you concerned about the other DC heroes like Mr. Terrific and Metamorpho and Hawkgirl um, being too much about world building and not enough about Superman? I think concerned for me is a little too harsh. I am... I'm curious how big of a part they're going to play in the movie because they've said they're not cameos. Mm. But... Are they going to be fighting alongside of him in the final act? I don't know. (laughs) And I'm curious to see how the story plays out. I don't think they're there strictly to world build. Um, I don't think those characters are the ones you would be introducing in this movie to world build. I think they're just filling out. I, this is kind of, I don't know if this is the same thing as world building. To me, they're just making the world look lived in. And I think that's what yeah. James Gunn has been trying to get across to everybody is this is a world where the heroes exist. This is not an origin story of a world. 
And I like that idea. And I, I do trust James Gunn. I, I don't want to sound cliche or even ignorant to it, but I, I mean, James Gunn introduced a ton of characters in guardians of the galaxy. And that's still one of my favorite Marvel movies. And those are characters I didn't even know, but at the core of that movie, if you really think about it, like it's still, um, star Lord story. Like, mm-hmm. do you feel yeah. like star Lord was neglected in that movie because all the other characters are there, I think everyone gets, you know, enough story. And I hope that James Gunn can use that talent for a Superman story. And, I mean, I, I do trust that it's going to be a Superman movie. He said that the title is now Superman. Like, even having legacy in the title, he thought, took away from the fact that this is a super Superman movie. Um, I'm I'm very optimistic, and I, I like the fact that it's a lived-in world. And who knows? I mean, when you read these comics, other characters pop in and out, and I think that's more or less what it's going to be. And I hope that's what it's going to be, because I, I honestly don't want to see Superman with these other characters fighting in the third act, if they're there for a reason and it's still focused on Superman, fine. But it, again, on paper, I'd prefer they're there in like the second act to try to figure some things out. And then Superman has to save the day on his own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I pretty much agree with everything you said. And I do understand the concern, even if I don't share the concern. Um, because James Gunn understands the concern Mm -hmm. because he's already addressed it. You know, he has said, I am choosing these characters because they absolutely fit into the story I want to tell about Superman. And he said, Clark has a world and Clark's world is Perry White and Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen. But Superman has a world too. And Superman's world includes Guy Gardner and Metamorpho and Hawkgirl. Like, and that made sense to me. And he insists that they are there because they're going to help along this story. So I also am not opposed to world building as long as it's not a huge distraction. So right now I'm taking him at his word and I'm letting him make his movie and I'm letting him tell his story. I think it is very premature to write off the movie or jump to conclusions when they've been shooting for a week, not even five days. So let him make the movie. And if at the end of it, we all go see it next year and we go, Oh my God, with backdoor pilot for a guy Gardner HBO Max show. Um, so be it. You know, we can certainly make that call then. But for now, he understands the concern. He has said that is not what I'm doing. And so right now, I'm going to trust him and let him make his movie and we'll see how it turns out. And for me, just as a big freaking nerd, I love getting a new Superman movie. But I'll be damned if I'm going to be mad that his new Superman movie also might include a Green Lantern and a Hawkgirl. I'm not going to be mad about it. I remember um, remember when they were making Superman Lives and Kevin Smith wrote a draft and apparently Kevin Smith's draft, uh, they called it a fanboy's uh, dream come true because there were like cameos from Justice Leaguers. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing that way back when in the 90s and going, oh my God, why can't they make that? And here we are and they are making it. And I can't wait to see it. Yeah, I I don't remember any of that, but I just remember like, I mean, I was excited when Black Adam introduced Hawk um Hawkman and yeah yeah all these other characters and and there were rumors for a long time that uh, Alicia Vikander wh- wh- who's the Tomb Raider Alicia yeah uh, yeah 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 it's v- Vikander I think Vikander? right. Um, there was rumors for a long time that she was going to play a hawk girl in the DCU. And I was so excited that we were getting a hawk girl too. And then, you know, everything changed. And I don't know if that was ever true. I mean, you know how that stuff goes. But right, like, right, right. Now we are. There we go. Sorry. Yeah. I, 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 no, I, yeah, I, I was drawing a blank again. But What um, happened to her? We haven't seen her in a minute. And I liked her. Yeah, we were supposed to get a Tomb Raider sequel for a while too. That yeah, I always really liked her. Anyway, yeah. sorry. Continue. But yeah, I... I mean, we're we're officially getting a Hawk Girl now, and yeah. we're officially getting a Guy Gardner, and we know, we hope that that Green Lantern show is coming on HBO Max finally, even though we never got the one we were promised. You know how many years ago? Again, backdoor pilot. You know what? One of my favorite episodes is Arrow is the backdoor pilot to the Flash. <laughs> so yeah, that's true. But it's still an Arrow episode. So if it's if it's done properly, I'm not going to complain about any of this. Like you said, how who wouldn't want all these characters showing up in a Superman movie if it's done well? That's the thing. You could you could have them only show up for two minutes and it can look like crap. So mm-hmm. it, it all depends on how it's executed. And I'm with you. I'm going to wait and see how it's executed before I start panicking. Because again, 
at this point, who are we to start panicking about stuff that's not even here yet? We we panic like up until the day these movies come out. Like, <laughs> like, like it would be crazy if you would see fans panicking um, because the Superman logo was slightly different than the Superman logo they like best. So that would be silly and ridiculous. And I can't imagine a world where that would happen. Like, there's enough stuff to panic about with the DC universe of what we already got. I, I'm not panicking over this kind of stuff. Where I'm just, I'm happy when these movies come out. Like, to me, I it's panicking about whether we're actually getting them. Right, exactly. Like, <laughs> there's like a list of 30 movies that we never got in the last 10 years. And I'm definitely not panicking over cameos in a Superman movie. <laughs> Right, right, exactly. So I'm, yeah, I'm not worried about it. Um, you know, and and again, yeah, let's let's uh, let him cook, as the kids like to say. <laughs> All right, well, um, closing the Wayne Manor mailbox. There are quite a few still in here, but most of them again are, are for the 10th anniversary. So we're just gonna hang on to those for that. Um, but Joe, I appreciate you hanging in there and helping me clean up some of these emails. My apologies to everybody who has written in, and I'm sorry it's taken me so long to get to a lot of them, but. I, I love it. I love the input, but unfortunately, you know, timing, we just can only do so many at a time. So I feel productive today. And Joe, I, I thank you for making the time. Oh, thank you again for having me. This is a lot of fun. I'm glad I was able to, I was glad I, glad I was able to make the time. Cause like I told you, I don't, I don't have a life at night. Once those kids go to bed, I'm good. So anytime you need me, I'm here. The only downside to me being on the show, like I say, every time is, um, I'm less likely to listen to the show when it comes on. You oh, know? I, oh, okay. You know, I see. How I'll, I'll, or, I'd rather if... listen. I'd rather listen to you and the other guys. You know, it's oh, it's. Okay. But you know, and I'm sorry that you know everyone else has to listen to me instead of you know the the regulars. But no, that's no. fine. We're always happy to have you. And Harley, God bless, she actually went to bed. Oh my God! So Harley, this one's also for you. Thanks for going to bed. If you're listening to this many years in the future. You went to sleep tonight, and I so appreciate it. Thank you for going to sleep. You're the best. We love you. Well, in um, reality, Andy, this one is for you. I mean, you you now get to go to sleep at a reasonable time, knock on oh wood. My God. And, I got to record a yeah. podcast, and it's still not even that late. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, anyway, we are going to wrap it up. So um, this was super fun. Joe, I, I do appreciate it. And Eric, if you're out there, thanks for lending me Joe for the night. You can have him back. Almost as good as new. Um for whatever else you guys, whatever other show you guys talk about Batman and stuff, Superman, I don't know, Blue Beetle. Um, so, Joe, where can we find you? I don't remember. Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd as J411. Uh, if you are not listening to the other podcast, which is uh, uh, The Fire Rises, a Batman podcast, which I screw up the name all the time, but that is the name. Um, and I think that's TFR Bat Pod on uh the socials so if you guys want to listen to us check us out please we really appreciate it um we do not cover the news it's more just uh try to finding like any excuse to talk any random thing like we try to find like random anniversaries or or just something that we we feel like discussing we did just discuss uh justice league crisis on infinite Earths part one in the last episode which was fun to cover so all we, right yeah we try to cover all sorts of different stuff like that and we do cover superman we did do it like man of steel last year so we we're the same boat we do adjacent stuff too so but thank you again for for having me on and and you know letting me say the uh the unmentionable uh podcast tm so yeah yeah the fire rises Anyway, uh, thank you guys for joining us. Thanks for downloading or streaming the show. Please do subscribe or follow the show wherever you get your podcasts. And please rate and review us where you get your podcasts. It's the quickest and easiest thing you can do to support us. Just a nice review goes a long way, and we would love that. Um, again, you can find Holy Batcast on Facebook, Twitter, X, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for Holy Batcast. And if you've got something for the Wayne Manor mailbox, you can send that to holybatcast at rf4rm.com. Our theme music was created by the talented Gora Venkateswar. You can find his work at gvtunes.com. And don't forget to check out our sponsors at manscaped.com. Do a little shopping and use that promo code BATSCAPED for 20% off and free shipping. But that will do it for this episode. On behalf of Joe, I've been Andy. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Same legacy time, same legacy channel, because that's the last time I get to say that. Holy Batcast is not affiliated with Warner Brothers or DC Entertainment. The views and opinions shared by the participants are theirs and theirs alone and do not represent the companies or organizations they happen to work for. I can't
can't believe my voice is still not fully back, but I don't know how bad it is. I don't know how bad it is, but it's just I'm like, I'm like, really? Like it's been over a week. This is crazy. I don't but, hear it while you're actually talking for the podcast. I hear it now a little bit where you start <clears> struggling, but you, yeah. you fake it well during the show. Oh, good. That's the, that's the idea. 